Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us today at Shan, uh, our Shan meeting for March. Um, stop blinking your eyes because the first quarter of the year is already over. We have, uh, you know, um, uh, what would it be? Probably uh, 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 31 days till Christmas. Um, <laughs> 31 weekends till Christmas. Uh, so, so uh, Shan, our organization, we have been around for over a decade now. Um, and where we formed initially was that we saw a need in the South Palm Beach County area. We had the Partnership for Aging, which was Central Palm Beach. We had um, ESRN that was down in the Broward area. We had um, uh, PRN Lighthouse, which was up in North, but there was never an organization that really served the healthcare community in the Southern part of Palm Beach County and the North part of Broward County. So that's where Shan initially uh, started, trying to fill that gap. And then how we further went ahead and separated ourselves from the rest of the organizations uh, that were in Palm Beach County is that we really focused on advocacy um, for our seniors and the healthcare community. Uh, Fern Robbins uh, worked with us very, very early on for the Scleroderma Project. Uh, and we brought some, had some great success there um, within that community and really shedding light on scleroderma and some of the options for treatment that were out there as well. Um, beyond that, we work on uh, networking and education. Um, each week we have, a, each month I should say, we have a terrific speaker, speaker that really educates us in regards to what their expertise is. And Dr. Ajian is going to do just that for us today. And we're really, really excited for that. Our mission is to advocate, educate, and provide a networking opportunity for our community. Myself, my name is John Dalton. I'm the owner of Optimum RTS, which is a full service medical employment agency, which really means that I'm working with different types of medical organizations to bring any type of level employee and that could be a front desk person, it could be a physician and everyone in between. Also work in facilities, uh, in extended living facilities, um, in the insurance side, in all aspects of healthcare. Um, more importantly in this room, um, I'm very proud to say I'm one of the founders of, uh, the, of our SHAN program here along with Barbara, uh, who is the true founder, I came in after her. Um, and we thank everybody for being here with us today. Our topic today is going to be COVID and its effects on the brain. And we have Dr. Ajian here with us. Um, excuse me while I read for just a moment. Dr. Daniel Ajian is a neurosurgeon from Memorial Neuroscience Institute where he treats patients with a wide array of spine disorders, including severe degenerative spine disease, spine trauma, cancer of the spine, spine tumors, peripheral nerve, surgery, and more. Born and raised in Boston, love that dirty water, he went to the University <laughs> of Michigan and fell in love with neuroscience. He attended Sackler School of Medicine in Tel Aviv University in Tel Aviv, Israel, before completing his residency at Rhode Island Hospital and a complex spine fellowship at John Hopkins University in Baltimore. Currently, in predominantly Memorial West Hospital, he focuses on treating a wide variety of not only primary, but metastatic spine and brain tumors. He has a close relationship with Memorial Cancer Institute and has established a multidisciplinary tumor board at Memorial Hospital West, consulting with oncologists, radiation oncologists, and neuroradiologists. He leads spine surgery at that facility, and he is able to provide expert consultation and intervention to a wide variety of patients and neurosurgical uh, diseases. He credits his international training with giving him a solid base for how to approach people from different cultures and a more hands-on approach. He fully embraces Memorial's focus on patient and family-centered care and the systems, systems multidisciplinary approach, which enables doctors from different specialties to work together to provide the most comprehensive care. Thank you most so much for joining us, Dr. Ajio, and I turn it over to you. Thank you so much, uh, everybody. I, I really uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here. And I don't know who you just introduced, but man, I would love to meet that guy. Uh, that, that is a very generous uh, 
uh, introduction. And uh, if I could just ask you to email that to my mom, uh, I would really, really appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> I think your mom wrote it, actually. <laughs> Oh, excellent, excellent. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I, I'm going to uh, share my screen here for a moment. Uh, so again, good morning and, and, and thank you so much for that introduction. Um, my name is Danny Agion and I'm, uh, I was going to be joined by my colleague, Dr. Scott Raffa. Uh, unfortunately, he uh, got pulled away this morning into uh, an emergency surgery and uh, won't be able to uh, be present on the call likely, but uh, we'll, we'll see how, how things go. Um, we, are, we are two of the neurosurgeons at the Memorial Neuroscience Institute and uh, really appreciate the opportunity to uh, present here to you, uh, to you guys today. Um, so just as, as an overview, uh, and I promise not to go over uh, the, the time, I wanted to provide an introduction to us and, and our team, uh, our vision, and some of the technologies that we have to offer and uh, touch on our COVID uh, update and experience here within the memorial system, and then perhaps focus on the future of uh, the neurosciences. I wanna take this opportunity also uh, first to, to thank the Boca Chamber, uh, John, uh, Jennifer, and, and Troy, and, and the valued Boca Chamber members here today for uh, again, allowing us to present in this forum. Um, Boca Raton is, is very special to me. I had the chance to chat for a few minutes before we began. Um, six years ago, after completing my, my fellowship, when I first moved to Florida with my wife and four amazing children, we settled in Boca. And this was sort of the, the pinnacle of a, of a 16 year uh, trek to really arrive in South Florida. And we've lived here ever since and absolutely love our community. Uh, my kids are in school at the Cats Hill Day School in Boca Raton and we're members of the Boca Raton Synagogue and uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here with, with friends and colleagues that I actually see on this, uh, on this Zoom. Uh, someone on this Zoom I ran into at a, at a local small business and uh, reminded me, hey, you're gonna be talking on Wednesday morning. <laughs> I was caught off guard. I said, oh yeah, that's right. So uh, I appreciate that. It's really good to see so many friends. And I fully support the, the, the Chamber's mission to, to promote and sustain the economic prosperity in Boca Raton and uh, South Palm Beach County. Boca is open. Uh, and the Chamber's key priority is really protecting our businesses. And uh, along with our professional team and the local council and commission, uh, you really continue to advocate on both a county and state level. Uh, so a big thank you to the Chamber for keeping Boca thriving during such a, a difficult time. It, you know, in, in placement of our neurosurgical patients post-operatively, we, I always wonder where, where can these patients go? And so it's, it's such a blessing to see so many of you that are in uh, healthcare and, and uh, potentially have the ability to help our, our patients here. So I look forward to continued relationship. Neurosurgery or, or neurological surgery is really the medical specialty concerned with the prevention, diagnosis, uh, surgical treatment, and even rehabilitation, especially of disorders which affect any portion of the nervous system, including the brain, spinal cord, uh, central and peripheral nervous system, as well as the cerebrovascular system. For me, a picture is worth a thousand words. And so I'm gonna mix it up here a little bit, but I wanna start off with a quick two minute video, if, if, if you guys would allow me, uh, about a young patient actually from Wellington, from Palm Beach County that came to Memorial after uh, an injury. And here, uh, Sandra, tell her story. Is that better? I was yeah. talking before. Yes. We were Thank you. And after the last jump, my horse tripped, she got herself back up. So she brought me up and then I just fell down. I had a lot of pain, but I just thought, just let me lay down here for like 10 minutes and then I'll just get up and just get back on the horse. And after I lay down for like half an hour, when they tried to sit me up, I just, the pain was too much. So that's when we decided to call 911. They told us that they will bring me to this hospital because my, even though my trauma wasn't as bad, they just wanted to make sure that I was, if it was something bad, it was going to be taken care of. What we discovered was that she had a very severe uh, lumbar burst fracture. The bone, uh, one of the bones of the spine had uh, sort of shattered and ruptured. And he told me that I needed to have a spinal fusion um, because of the type of fracture that I had. Putting screws above and below 
uh, this area here to stabilize the fracture and also opened up a small area from the back of the spine to allow us to decompress and uh, uh, push away that fragment of bone that was pushing on the nerves and the spinal sac. He really gets involved with the patient, like makes sure that, okay, if you need me, I'm here. Even my mom's like, he's just perfect. <laughs> I remember her face and her reaction when I told her that it would be at least a year before she was able to horseback ride again, if she was able to. And that just struck her, but she persevered, she fought right through it. I love horses, but I'm sure I cannot be away from them. I know when I start riding, it's something that's going to be on my mind all the time. But now it's just, uh, sometimes I don't, I don't even think, I don't even feel like I had a surgery. If everything continues to go well as it has, and Sandra's able to demonstrate that she has fused those segments, uh, and her body is laying down bone and stabilizing that area, uh, I'm really hopeful that she'll be able to, to get back to uh, competitive horseback riding. I'm Sandra, and Memorial helped me with my back injury. I, I appreciate you guys uh, allowing, uh, allowing us to, to show that uh, video. Thank God Sandra is, is doing well. Um, and there's so many patients out there that are really looking for, for care, you know, just as, just as she was. And, and so what we do is we really provide neurosurgery services at three primary locations uh, in, in Boca Raton on uh, Glades Road, 900 Glades Road in the medical office building there. That's our newest location, actually. Uh, and then Memorial Hospital West in Pembroke Pines. That's really where I do uh, uh, primarily uh, most of uh, my surgeries and also at our level one trauma center in, uh, in, in Hollywood. I was joined uh, initially by uh, Dr. Rafa, and I wanted to take a moment to introduce uh, him, uh, my colleague also, uh, who is gonna be present on today's meeting. Uh, he, he's a neurosurgeon in our group who joined us in uh, 2020. And uh, Dr. Rafa, uh, I'm, I'm a bit jealous of Dr. Rafa. He not only is a, a neurosurgeon, but also has an MBA. So uh, I, I, I envy that. Uh, Dr. Rafa really is South Florida. Um, he was at University of South Florida uh, for uh, medical school, uh, as well as his internship and residency, and then uh, did his fellowship uh, uh, down here in Miami at uh, uh, University of Miami School of Medicine. And really myself and Dr. Rafa are the two uh, neurosurgeons within our group that are seeing patients in Boca at the uh, 900 uh, Glades, uh, Glades Road uh, location. Um, and uh, Scott has really been an amazing uh, addition to, to our team. Uh, like you had uh, mentioned, uh, John, I grew up in, in, in Boston, born and raised, uh, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, and, and then I went on to the uh, University of Michigan in Ar Arbor for my bachelor's degree in, in neuroscience. And my wife and I thereafter recently married and uh, traveled to Israel, actually, to study medicine at Tel Aviv University. I was uh, all set uh, to, to actually... Uh, practiced neurosurgery there, but uh, was accepted into Brown University for my internship and residency uh, at the Rhode Island Hospital and uh, completed my seven-year neurosurgery training over there in 2015. And then looking for some more torture and, and pain, uh, moved to Baltimore, Maryland, where I completed a fellowship in, in complex spine surgery and spine oncology. Uh, and so since really 2016, we've been down here in, uh, in Boca. Uh, and I am board certified and a member of our neurological societies, uh, the, the American Association of Neurological Surgeons, as well as the CNS, the Congress of Neurological Surgeons. And so you can see here listed some of the conditions that we treat. These really uh, include all types of brain tumors, both malignant or uh, uh, metastatic tumors. Uh, primary tumors are, are really tumors that arise within the brain. Uh, metastatic tumors are tumors that spread from other locations to the brain, such as the lung, breast, prostate, etc., uh, And we also treat a host of spinal disorders, including uh, trauma, as you saw, spinal tumors, uh, and peripheral nerve surgery, carpal tunnel, uh, nerve decompressions, and, and what have you. Uh, two of our latest additions to our program is a comprehensive epilepsy team uh, who uh, really treat seizures both surgically and non-surgically, meaning with medications, uh, as well as deep brain stimulation. Deep brain stimulation basically consists of uh, placing electrodes uh, into the brain uh, to help treat Parkinson's disease, 
uh, tremors, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, and, and really now a whole host of uh, neuropsychiatric uh, disorders. And from the vascular uh, side or the, the brain blood vessel side, we also treat brain aneurysms and, and all vascular disorders of the brain. Uh, we even screen patients who have a family history of brain aneurysm uh, rupture. Uh, we treat all different types of vascular uh, malformations. And so this is our adult neurosurgery team. Uh, our Neuroscience Institute currently has seven neurosurgeons uh, as our comprehensive service. And we really cover all areas that we spoke about. Uh, some of our physicians specialize in individual areas such as spine, brain tumors, uh, the vascular and, and endovascular. Uh, we all do uh, trauma as well. Um, and then functional neurosurgery, which is essentially the epilepsy and uh, movement disorder, uh, Parkinson's disease uh, surgeries. We cover all of the uh, six hospitals uh, within the uh, South Broward area and the entire healthcare system on both an inpatient and uh, outpatient offices. Our neurointerventional program is really staffed by three outstanding uh, doctors, Dr. Ajiboye, Dr. Mehta, and Dr. Davis. Dr. Davis actually does both open and endovascular work, which means through a small catheter in the groin, we're able to get up into the brain uh, with small coils and, and treat certain blood vessel conditions of the brain. They, they cover our aneurysms, the vascular malformations, and even our stroke cases within the, the healthcare system. And this program has really grown over the last five years, and uh, we're currently undergoing comprehensive stroke certification at Memorial West. Uh, we already have it at Memorial Regional. Um, and with their skills and expertise, our stroke center uh, uh, care for these patients has really been faster than the national average and really remarkable results. Uh, and, and they continue to innovate and push the envelope in cerebrovascular care. I wonder how many folks on, on this uh, Zoom have actually interacted with some of our patients given the long-term healthcare uh, placement and needs that all, all of you are involved with. So I thank you for that and look forward to, to growing that relationship as well. We're also very fortunate to have two outstanding pediatric neurosurgery colleagues at Joe DiMaggio Children's Hospital uh, under the leadership of Dr. Dean Hertzler. They offer comprehensive pediatric neurosurgery care. They work closely with us uh, in collaboration, including surgeries, call coverage, conferences, uh, and meetings. And they're located in uh, Boca as well, uh, Hollywood and our Wellington location. We also have 12 employed neurologists uh, uh, led by Dr. Uh, Zacharia, the director of the neurology program. Uh, they offer comprehensive and, and really nationally recognized care for subspecialty areas of epilepsy, headache neurology, multiple sclerosis, uh, again, our movement disorders, neuromuscular disorders, and uh, uh, five locations, uh, in three in Broward, two in Miami-Dade, and uh, going to be expanding to the Boca location as well uh, in, in the coming uh, months, which is, which is great. And so they cover all of our hospitals as well as our uh, code strokes across uh, the healthcare system. And, and recently, the neurology team has also embarked on an educational journey. Um, uh, they have neurology residents. This is the second year of our neurology residency program with Dr. Sue Bay, our multiple sclerosis uh, specialist as the uh, residency uh, program director. And they rotate with us actually within neurosurgery in their first year uh, in both uh, the operating room and, uh, and the clinic. Uh, we have two <laughs> hospitalists. Uh, and our third is starting uh, this, this summer. They cover the in-house neurology patients and, and consults. Some of you may remember uh, Dr. Kniff actually from the very first season uh, of the show Survivor. Uh, unfortunately, he did get uh, booted off the island <laughs> at some point. Uh, our neuropsychology uh, division really provides comprehensive uh, array of services, which is really vital to the preoperative and postoperative care of our, of our patients. Uh, they assess the patient's cognitive, emotional, behavioral functioning status, and really you know, use a battery of standardized measures and tools and tests uh, customized to, to each individual patient. Um, and uh, this team has actually been helping us in the operating room during things like awake craniotomies for, for brain tumor resections. Not everybody can undergo uh, you know, five, six hour awake uh, surgery. And uh, they really continue to help care for our patients with, with uh, coping with loss and, and deficits uh, or certain troubling diagnoses. So during our COVID experience, this team has really been particularly helpful in, in guiding our patients uh, and, uh, and their, their family members. We also have neurointensivists. They are dual trained uh, and board certified doctors in, in both neurology and ICU. Uh, they help manage our sickest uh, uh, patients admitted uh, to the intensive care unit, Dr. Patel and Dr. Chen. 
And so really here at Memorial, our, our team consists of physicians, nurse practitioners, intensivists, therapists, uh, case managers, social workers, and, and we really uh, are, are a team. We, we, we round together, we collaborate, uh, preoperative and postoperative uh, uh, patient services, and we really rely on being a team and bringing that team approach to our overall care. Uh, our patients meet the team and they know each player in the team and their responsibility. Uh, and this really obviously helps with communication, patient satisfaction, and, and overall improved outcome from the patient standpoint. And it also makes our lives on the physician end uh, tremendously more efficient. Uh, I don't wanna spill the beans. I'm sort of the anti-doctor doctor. doctor. Uh, I really, really believe that most of what we do, it, it's not the surgery, uh, it's not the, the lingo, it's not the you know, fancy schmancy meetings, it is really the communication. It is all about caring for the patients as if they were our family members and advocating for the patients. Because patients in the hospital, especially during COVID, when our ICUs and our hospitals were filled and we weren't allowing visitors, unfortunately. Patients were going through a very difficult time and their families were also going through a very, very challenging time. Most of what made our care successful was the personal attention and the communication. That is really, uh, you can teach anybody to, to become a doctor. You can, you can sort of teach anybody uh, that the skills needed. It may take some time, but most of what we really do and the care that we really specialize in is our communication, our individualized care, and uh, setting patients up for success, both preoperatively and postoperatively in that, in that setting. Once they're out of the hospital, we do not lose touch with them. And that rehabilitation and uh, their long-term living situation is something that we really look to you guys all for, for that support and that help in maintaining their successful outcome. Because we can do a great job surgically and our MRIs and CAT scans can look perfect. But if the patient didn't understand what they had done, and if they are not happy with their out outcome, we've really, we've really failed. Um, and so our vision at Memorial is really to become the premier destination for neuroscience services in South Florida, um, using our cutting edge technology and new innovations and the care and compassion for our patients. That's really the Memorial way. And uh, I believe that we can, we can achieve this. In and around the operating rooms, we use special equipment, uh, image guided navigation tools to place spinal hardware and other image guided technology to locate hard to reach brain tumors potentially. And these devices really help create a minimally invasive approach to brain and spine care. Uh, we can minimize disruption to critical areas surrounding our target. And we're also now using robotics. I know robotics and you know, lasers are kind of this big hot topic and patients come in asking us to use the laser. Um, but you know, we're really sort of using a lot of this up-to-date technology uh, when appropriate, uh, which is a, a big issue. Uh, when appropriate to really aid in surgical planning and, uh, and delivery. As I touched on before, the neurosciences in general uh, are really on the cutting edge of technology and you know, really all about the computer brain interface. And at Memorial, uh, you know, working towards the future, we really believe that what we're doing now will slowly evolve and uh, uh, progress to more and more utilization of technology, uh, computers, uh, robots, uh, however, while we really maintain that deep personal care and attention uh, to, to our patients. Deep brain stimulation uh, and, and uh, those deep brain stimulation indications have really bought, broadened over the past decade. Uh, and so as we can expand not only our targets in the brain, uh, little areas that we can either disrupt or lesion or even electrically stimulate uh, in a minimally invasive way potentially, uh, I think this is really the future of all brain and spine care. It, it's very ignorant of us to think that sort of what we're doing now is sort of the, you know, the ultimate and, and, and nobody um, can, uh, uh, you know, compete. And, and uh, you know, in 50 years from now, they're going to be looking back at us and going, gosh, what the heck were they doing? I can't believe they made these big incisions on their heads and, and you know, drilled the skull and did all this stuff. You know, now we have targeted treatments. And so uh, it, it's a slow uh, evolution, but it is something that we definitely uh, are a part of and would like to be a part of. And uh, with, with all of your help, I think, uh, understanding what patients need outside of the hospital, in their rehab, uh, in their long-term care is really what allows us to sort of see what patients are, are looking for and what, what they need and how we can help provide that uh, to, the, to the patients and their families. And so for me, it's really all about education. Uh, we do a tremendous amount of community outreach uh, such as this. Uh, we give lectures and presentations that really involve our broader community to engage and partner with us in the mission. Uh, Dr. Mehta, uh, uh, our stroke 
uh, interventional neurointerventional uh, radiologists and his team do regular stroke education um, with EMS services in the area and really educate them on rapid response times uh, and our motto of time is brain. Uh, you know, th through these lectures and symposiums and, and um, networking uh, uh, opportunities, we're really able to reach a broad network of not only healthcare providers, but also business owners, uh, entrepreneurs, uh, such as yourselves. Uh, and, and so for that, we really, really are, are appreciative. COVID at Memorial and in our communities has really been uh, difficult. Uh, thank God we're coming out of a difficult time in healthcare, uh, I think right now, and uh, we've remained uh, open and active throughout the past year. Memorial was on one of only two healthcare systems that received uh, the first COVID-19 vaccines uh, at the direction uh, of, of our governor. Uh, and we were also able to distribute some of those doses to surrounding hospitals and uh, the community. This data here that you see is, is now somewhat dated, but um, it takes a couple of weeks to sort of compile a lot of this stuff. And you can see the tremendous surge that we experienced last summer within our system. Uh, our neurosurgery services remained quite active, uh, still treating most of our urgent tumor cases. Those patients can't wait, you know, months and months to have surgery. Uh, obviously our trauma, uh, or emergent surgeries, uh, unfortunately, such as this morning with Dr. Rafa, uh, you know, physicians and our allied health teams were actually deployed to COVID units to uh, to help during these surges. And so some of our uh, allied health professionals and nurse practitioners and PAs were actually deployed away from our uh, nuclear family into the uh, ICUs and into the other areas uh, to help with the uh, intensive care units uh, and, and other areas. So thankfully our system is not currently overwhelmed uh, or, or struggling any longer. Uh, we still are, uh, you know, still do have in-house patients, but we've been able to maintain appropriate care for our both critical and elective uh, patient populations here at Memorial West. Uh, I never thought of a busier time actually than during COVID. You know, a lot of folks were home earlier and on Zoom and, you know, I was looking forward to some downtime with my with my family, but uh, uh, we, we were still pretty active and, and our, um, volume here was was quite quite steady. Um, and so a lot of people have asked, well, what types of cases, what types of neurological or neurosurgical cases did we see during COVID? And I, I think obviously respiratory situations were, were the biggest. And so uh, some of our patients unfortunately contracting uh, a COVID and requiring uh, ventilatory support uh, when needed and ICU stay. Uh, uh, I think the main thing uh, from a primary neurological and neurosurgical issue was really strokes uh, in, in the younger population. Uh, and so I've personally operated on multiple uh, COVID patients, uh, multiple spine fractures, patients that came in with an injury were diagnosed with COVID through a rapid uh, a test in the emergency room were COVID positive, unfortunately had uh, an issue that had to be treated though emergently. And so we took them to the operating room with full precaution, you know, multiple layers and, and uh, uh, N95 masks and face shields and, you know, sort of is a bit disruptive to, to our normal routine in the operating room. Uh, one case that really stands out was a young man uh, in his 30s with a large blood clot actually in the cerebellum. Uh, and, and he had a large uh, stroke and a bleed in the brain. Uh, and that he actually required emergent decompression, uh, removing some of the bone from the back of the skull, evacuating that blood clot uh, and, and allowing uh, the pressure to sort of be relieved. Uh, and so uh, there was a lot of early stuff coming out about higher risk of strokes, especially in younger patients with COVID. I'll be the first one to tell you things are still really early. You know, every, anybody that speaks in sort of matter of fact language, uh, I, I would take with a, with a grain of salt. I think this is still very early. Um, we haven't seen uh, a, too many of those situations. And so uh, is it COVID-19 specific? Is it, you know, true, true, unrelated? Uh, we don't know. And I think it's okay to say, you know, we, we don't know. But I think that was a particular case that stood out in, in, uh, in, in my mind. So, you know, overall, why choose uh, Memorial? Uh, obviously, so many hospitals to choose from in South Florida. And I, and I thank our Marcus neuroscience uh, colleagues I'm around the corner from you guys. And uh, I thank you guys for being present uh, on, on the Zoom as well today. Um, you know, in my mind, Memorial stands out. We have a, a community-based focus, individualized care, and really a one-stop shop uh, for everyone. We, we provide a vast array of fellowship trained specialists. And um, I'll just say, you know, I live in Boca and uh, I've never been happier working, working at Memorial. Here are some of our most uh, uh, recent achievements, uh, awards, recognitions, 
Uh, thank God many, many achievements and we continue to strive for, for continued excellence. Our stroke program has really obtained the highest status from the American Heart and American Stroke Association, uh, Joint Commission Certified Comprehensive Stroke Center. Uh, was, Memorial Regional was the first and only one in Broward County and Memorial West right now is a, a Joint Commission Certified uh, Thrombectomy Center. And again, currently undergoing comprehensive stroke certification. Uh, and, and our spine program <clears throat> is, uh, was awarded the Blue Cross Blue Shield Center of, uh, of Distinction and you know, many that you can see, see here, thankfully. So uh, this is our team. I welcome you to reach out to us uh, both you know, individually, uh, personally, uh, or as a group. And uh, Dr. Rafa and I are really looking to expand and broaden the, the Boca practice and bring the memorial experience uh, right, right to, our, uh, right to our, our backyard. Uh, I thank you very, very much for giving us the time to present uh, here today. And I wanna thank each of you, really the business owners uh, and, and the managers and the healthcare providers that we rely on to support uh, our patients and who you really support our local economy and allow the community to thrive and prosper while really creating the best uh, county to live in. Uh, thank you. And I'm really happy to take any questions uh, uh, if, there, if there are any. Good morning, Doc. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Again, for that great lecture. I am going to ask you a question to start off. Um, with COVID, we heard so much about uh, the brain fog uh, that was one of the primary symptoms um, of somebody that contracted COVID. Are there, are there any studies in regards to uh, what that was or how that might affect long haulers also? Right, great question. So uh, I think a lot of the stuff is still uh, ongoing. Uh, that brain fog was initially uh, uh, something that was, uh, uh, you know, put out there and initially created a lot of confusion because we weren't sure what we were seeing. And uh, I think that the, the multifactorial nature of, of, of these patients and really the sickest patients had so much going on uh, that uh, it was really hard to sort of identify what was the primary underlying condition versus, okay, what was actually caused by the virus itself. Um, unfortunately, we really didn't have a, a primary treatment for that, it was treating the underlying, you know, underlying disease. Uh, to date, I mean, we don't have specific markers, we don't have uh, specific, uh, you know, uh, genetic measures or things that we can really look at. So a lot of that stuff is ongoing. Uh, personally, I'll be honest, I've been a little slow uh, in, in uh, uptake of, of the, the most recent data, because again, a lot of it, this is so new. Uh, I personally would like to give that some more time to sort of um, uh, play itself out and sort of see what, what was related, what are the long-term ramifications of that? Uh, the COVID patients that I did end up operating on, uh, thank God, uh, didn't have any long-term lasting effects. Uh, a lot of them do still have a subjective sense of uh, decreased stamina and still some shortness of breath with, um, with sort of exercise or pushing their, their tolerance. Mentally, uh, neurologically, short-term memory, all that kind of stuff, have not really seen anything in, in my particular patients that were long-lasting outside of their hospital stay. Uh, some of them did not recall their hospital stay, which is interesting. But again, these patients sometimes can be heavily medicated and you know ICU delirium and things like that. So directly related, don't know yet, but definitely something that was put out there that, um, that we heard a lot about. Excellent, thank you so much. Does anyone else have any questions? Please just speak up. Um, I have a couple of questions, non COVID related. <laughs> How do you know like, uh, that you have some big brain issue that you have to see, you know, a, a, neuro a neurologist? I mean, I can say I have a headache almost every day of my life, but I'm married, have a kid, and have three dogs and work full time. So, like, that is, you know, normal life. But then you hear about these people, oh, one day they just like drop dead or had an aneurysm. So, I'm, of course, totally paranoid about that. So how do you kind of distinguish what's like a really serious issue versus just life? Right, right, Jennifer. I mean, it's it's a great it's a great question, and um, I'll be honest, it's it's something that uh, you know around the neighborhood you sort of you know get get a lot of. How do you know when it's time to? <laughs> You're trapped. You have to answer the question. <laughs> no, I, and, and I will, and I will. I'm gonna try to be. I'm gonna try to be very, very specific too, because again, there's so many issues that just cause normal, normal things. I, I think that persistent symptoms. So something that comes and goes in general is usually not something that that we worry about. If there's a triggering event, also that's something that, in general, you can say, okay, it was probably attributed to you know X, Y, or Z. If there is uh, two symptoms. So say 
headache with numbness, headache with tingling, or or facial droop with double vision, or you know, yeah, my eyes kind of get blurry, but occasionally there's also darkness or blackness. So if there's a second symptom, that then is usually something that I would say warrants the next step. So some imaging. Now, whether that's through your primary care physician or through a neurologist, a neurosurgeon, usually things by the time they've sort of come to neurosurgery, they've been either imaged or worked up and a neurologist or a primary care doctor will say, okay, this is something that requires potentially a surgical or non-surgical approach, but um, there's there's some data to say, okay, this person needs referral to that. Uh, if there's something that, that lasts, now if there's something that goes on more than six months, even something small like low back pain, you know, neck pain, we all get low back pain, we all get neck pain, uh, it's something that just, especially now we're all in computers and everybody's on their phone looking down and, you know, the number of kids we're seeing these days just from horrible neck pain, staring down at their cell phones all day. It, it's, it's, it's tremendous and, and it's, it's, it's so unfortunate. But if there's something that lasts more than six months, that's a rough kind of estimate where you say, okay, these are symptoms that have persisted, haven't really gone away. And if there's that second component, numbness, tingling, weakness, double vision, blurry vision, um, if someone else points something out to you and say, you know what, I've noticed X, Y, or Z. At that point for me, I'll get an image, you know, and please God, everything looks, looks good and there's nothing to do there, but at least to get to that next step of an image where you can sort of rule out something big, bad, and dangerous. Aneurysms are the tough one. Aneurysms and, and uh, you know, those can be very tough because a lot of times they go undiagnosed until some sort of event. Those are things that we have a hard time picking up on unless there is a family history. So one thing we do at Memorial is we do screen patients, first degree family members that have had aneurysms. Those are patients that we screen. We get an MRI of the brain, MRA, special uh, MRI looking at the blood vessels of the brain. We will screen those patients, totally asymptomatic. We screen those patients to see whether they have any aneurysms in the brain, uh, which can then be treated up front or prophylactically, as we call it, before, God forbid, some event or some dangerous event. Strokes. Strokes just happen. Families could, oh, he was fine. He was doing great. He was working. No issues until, boom, something something happens. And could we have prevented it? That's where your, your, your routine follow-up, diabetic, uh, you know, blood sugar control, uh, hypertension, blood pressure, elevated blood pressure control, taking your medications regularly, uh, you know, having the blood glucose, your sugars checked regularly, blood pressure control, uh, obesity, you know, exercise, all these kind of things of what we call prevention and preventative medicine. Those are things that can ultimately reduce the risk of stroke in this day and age. It's 2021. We're still, we're still kind of, you know, trying to get things before they happen. I think uh, genetics and family history underlying disorders do raise a little bit of a flag where we can sometimes image early, but uh, most of the time, thank God, a lot of it is just normal human being wear and tear and daily stress. But if there's that second issue or something lasting more than six months, Jennifer, I would say that's the point where you can sort of say, hey, let's go to the next step. Let's get a consult or let's uh, sort of move to some sort of imaging. So a little bit of a long-winded answer, but trying to be as specific as possible. It's hard for us to predict the future. We don't have that crystal ball, but I think we're getting better and better at that. Well, I feel much more than thank you. <laughs> David, personal living, you have a question. Yeah, when you were talking about young people and COVID, I was just kind of curious, how young have, has anybody seen, is, have you seen infants or, and what kind of long-term effects have there been on the younger ones versus the, maybe the, the preteens versus the teens and things like that? Right, great question. So uh, Joe DiMaggio actually has some experience with uh, uh, very, very rare uh, in, in younger, in infants and, and, and uh, uh, children uh, below teenage uh, age uh, with this sort of multi-system inflammatory kind of uh, uh, reaction and, and response to the virus. It can turn into sort of multi-system uh, organ failure, uh, unfortunately. Um, more, you know, kidneys, heart, lungs than, than brain uh, and, and spinal cord. Uh, but that's really where the younger kids have been uh, 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 the most really affected. Kids in general have not been, uh, uh, from what we've, we've seen, a major, uh, uh, you know, major source of, of, of 
both contraction or transmission of the virus, thankfully. So that's what's sort of allowed the schools to be uh, open here relatively safely. Um, I think that uh, the next jump from there is probably uh, the 20s and 30s. And that's sort of where we started seeing some of these more uh, stroke or blood vessel type of issues related uh, to COVID uh, that, that needed uh, attention. Beyond the 30s, it's sort of the smokers and more respiratory type of heart lung patients, asthmatics, uh, that were really sort of getting uh, the, 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 the intensive care unit uh, treatment. So I think more of that multi-system inflammatory response in the younger children, uh, middle school, teenage, basically, you know, okay. And then, you know, 20s and 30s, more of that stroke uh, and neurovascular type issues. And then 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, obviously uh, above 75, the mortality, it, it jumps at that point. Below 75, uh, again, relatively low, low risk of mortality, uh, generally speaking. Um, uh, again, generally and broadly, I, I know people have been very tremendously affected and people have had family members even on this call that have been uh, lost, unfortunately, and, and have been severely affected by this. But just, just generally speaking, I think that those are sort of the, the groups that we saw in the, in the hospital. Um, Melanie. Thank you. Thanks, David. I have a question to your earlier discussion um, for family history. What if you are, like myself, adopted at three days old, don't know any family history, what are your suggestions for just keeping good with checkups and everything on yearly to make sure that you don't have any neurological <laughs> issues going on? Yeah, no, absolutely. Great, great question. So um, without that family history, it's uh, uh, we end up uh, sort of categorizing those situations in, you know, sort of the, 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 the non-high-risk population, uh, most aneurysms don't rupture, right? So most people don't have stroke. So again, kind of, kind of broadly speaking, um, I think that uh, that regular health maintenance and, and uh, overall, you know, BMI, uh, blood sugar control, blood pressure, uh, uh, there are certain screenings uh, at certain ages. So for example, colonoscopies, you know, we can detect early colon cancers and there is a, a an improvement and an earlier detection by screening healthy people with colonoscopies where we can then catch and treat things earlier. In a lot of the brain situations, uh, we haven't sort of reached that. And it, and it sounds, you know, disgusting to say, well, we need that critical number to reach to then say it's worthwhile and it's financially responsible and, you know, the insurance companies approve it. We, we hit a roadblock, unfortunately, when the insurance companies say, hey, how come this patient's getting an MRI? They're totally asymptomatic. They have no problems. They just want one. It, it's a little difficult in this day and age to sort of just get imaging for no real reason, uh, just because of the, the nature of, 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 you know, medicine these days. So there usually does need to be some sort of indication for it, for the insurance company to then say, okay, this makes sense and we approve it. So uh, again, unless it's sort of one of these, you know, chest X-ray in a smoker or a CT scan rather than a smoker or colonoscopies uh, at the age of, you know, 50 or, you know, 45 or 40 in patients that have a family history of colon cancer, earlier screening has been shown to be beneficial in certain uh, diseases. Um, with, you know, the aneurysm and stroke and more of the neurological things, unfortunately, these conditions are so rare. You know, we see brain tumors every, every day, but uh, they're in general, from the bigger population uh, standpoint, they're just so rare that everyone isn't going around getting an MRI, you know, once a year because uh, most of those are, are just going to be entirely, entirely negative. So on an individual uh, you know, a, a personal sort of evaluation, I, I would say routine follow-up you know, for healthy people once a year with a physician, blood work once a year, cholesterol uh, uh, checks, uh, you know, blood pressure uh, control, uh, blood sugar maintenance, most of, um, and again, regular, you know, exercise, most of uh, things that happen as we age potentially could have been either caught earlier or treated earlier if we knew about them. And so that's the, the sort of thin line that we need to try to walk between, uh, you know, maintenance, prevention, and then surveillance and treatment, you know, afterwards. So uh, I, I think it's it's something that I still struggle with as well. Saves me a lot of paperwork at the doctor's office, I'll say that. <laughs> oh, absolutely, absolutely. 
again, any symptoms, you know, if there's a symptom that, that's, that's, you know, you or, or, or family or, or, you know, friends are, are, are talking about, if it's something where um, it, it's persistent and, uh, you know, unresponsive to conservative treatment, you know, so low back pain that kind of gets better with some anti-inflammatory medications, uh, you know, neck pain that, that gets better when, you know, you have a massage or sort of, you know, lay down and the kids are all in bed. Um, that's something that, you know, I, I think is, is reasonable. If it's something that persists or there's, you know, a secondary issue, numbness, tingling, weakness, that's when we sort of say, okay, hey, what's causing this? Let's get a picture. Let's get some electrodiagnostic information to try to find out what is causing it. And is it okay or does it need to be treated in some other way? That's great. <laughs> and I had a quick question relating to, you mentioned numbness and all that, um, how the brain relates to peripheral neuropathy. Great, great question. Um, a lot of you I'm sure have heard of these medications like Neurontin uh, or Gabapentin. Gabapentin, yeah. Gabapentin or, or Lyrica, which is pregabalin. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, the issue can be, um, as we all age, as our spine, you know, I, I say we can patch the tire sometimes. We can't replace the tire. And so, you know, as we age and we all develop, you know, low back pain, neck pain, arthritis, just, just degeneration, you know, it's like a, like a building that, that starts to sort of go through some wear and tear. And, you know, sometimes we have to put some scaffolding up on that building. <laughs> our nerve endings, the very tips of our nerves degenerate and, and they degenerate as normal life goes on. That's kind of the natural history of, of our nerves. Uh, the tips of those nerves, those nerve endings start to degenerate. And so people feel some numbness, tingling at the fingertips, um, you know, and a lot of times there are these nerve modulating medications like gabapentin and, and Lyrica that, that is given out, you know, like, like candy. It can help. It can definitely help. Um, uh, there isn't something these days that uh, we have to uh, regenerate those nerves, if you will. We can slow that sort of degenerative process. And, and a lot of times what I found is people is, are sort of given this general blanket peripheral neuropathy. And so if it's equal on both sides, you know, if it's bilateral, if it's both toes, you know, both feet, uh, the tips of the toes or the tips of the fingers, uh, you know, that's usually something where you say, okay, that's seems equal. It seems, you know, a lot of people describe it like a glove on their hand or socks on their feet, even though they're not wearing any gloves or socks. That's something that can be very typical for that peripheral neuropathy. It usually doesn't require much other than some medication. What we tend to see though is if it's unilateral, meaning one-sided, you know, yeah, just my right arm, just my right hand, my thumb and my index finger are, are numb. And, um, you know, when I wake up at night, I got a lot of tingling and I kind of shake it out and, you know, kind of gets better. Okay, well, that may be carpal tunnel. So a lot of people will sort of attribute that to neuropathy or they have a diagnosis from 10 years ago of a peripheral neuropathy. Uh, uh, diabetics, diabetics do get diabetic neuropathy. Those nerve endings uh, do kind of break down. Um, so, so I, I just, I think there are some instances where we sort of say, you know what, if it's one-sided, if it's not equal, uh, then there may be something underlying causing that. Um, and that's something where we sort of would say, okay, this may not just be a neuropathy, that sort of black hole diagnosis. There may be something causing that, a pinched nerve, a disc herniation, carpal tunnel, a compressed nerve, you know, whether it's in the spinal cord or not, usually those peripheral neuropathies are not uh, uh, central, you know, meaning from the brain, usually they're more distal, they're more in the cervical, thoracic, or lumbar areas, or even in the peripheral nerve area, something compressing uh, those, those nerves. So those medications do help. Unfortunately, there's a lot of side effects. Sleepiness, kind of loopiness, people feel it really makes them groggy and um, they don't like taking it. Um, peripheral neuropathy isn't dangerous, again, as long as it is just that peripheral neuropathy. Thank you very much. <laughs> Absolutely. Other questions? Okay. Um, I just have one more quick one then. Sorry, because things I've been dying to know and you're sitting yeah, here. Please, please. Where, where are we as a country in terms of uh, paralysis? And I, I don't want to say curing, but like working, you know, um, you know, you hear about all this research with like the Christopher Reed Foundation. I guess that's really what I'm talking about. I'm not really asking the question in a very eloquent way, sorry. 
And, and you hear how like other countries like Israel have sped that up and stem cells and all that. So I guess like that's a lot to unpack, but I think you kind of, you know, you know what I'm asking, how far have we come with, with that? Right, no, absolutely. So, so a lot of, you know, I'll, I'll be honest, what we struggle with day to day is a patient comes in after a uh, spinal cord injury, for example, and they've had some spine trauma where their spinal cord is, is, is bruised, is, is compressed, uh, hopefully not severed, but occasionally we, we have seen that. Um, and we struggle with a lot of the uh, promoted and, you know, sort of what's, what's new and, you know, what's new and sexy out there, right? Uh, freezing patients, hypothermia, uh, you know, steroids, all these things, football players, you know, that have been uh, cured from paralysis. And uh, it's very difficult for uh, the general public and myself to sort of tease out, okay, what, what, is, what is real? What is, what is medically accurate? And what is, you know, media and fluff and, and all of that? Um, we have come a long way. I think that uh, we used to give steroids, uh, strong anti-inflammatory. We used to give steroids in traumatic spinal cord injuries. These days, there's probably three centers in the country that are still giving steroids. Most people are not giving steroids any longer. What we have moved to is early surgical decompression. So removing the pressure. If the spinal cord is being pinched, removing that pressure from the spinal cord earlier than we ever used to. People used to wait 72 hours, for example, letting things settle down and then removing the pressure. These days we're doing acute and hyper acute, middle of the night surgery. We're doing those in the middle of the night, no matter what, to try to relieve that pressure as early as possible. Because again, time is brain or time is spinal cord. And so getting the blood flow to that area is the most important thing. Over the course of one year, two years, we see patients with weakness or paralysis improve somewhat. Patients that are what's called a complete spinal cord injury where they have no motor function or no sensation, those patients in general do not uh, improve significantly to the point of functional uh, 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 use and, and sort of functional recovery. There was about 11% based on the old research, 11% of patients that were what were called those complete spinal cord injuries or they had no motor function, no sensation function, no bowel, no bladder function that actually uh, improved one or two uh, uh, grades of function. However, it wasn't sort of neurologically functional. Um, they were able to maybe feel here, feel there. Um, but my opinion on this, and again, my, just as one, as one neurosurgeon, I, I think that time is really what heals. So over a year, over two years, there are patients that do recover. Um, with aggressive rehabilitation, with aggressive, you know, uh, 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 cognitive uh, uh, rehab. And, and a lot of this is just, you know, mental buy-in for a lot of these patients um, saying they can do it. I can do it. I can move. I literally have seen patients be up and, and walk uh, again. Um, the hypothermia and, and you know, the, these sort of, uh, so, so, you know, Christopher Reeve Foundation, unfortunately, it depends on the level of the injury. High cervical spinal cord injuries that affect both arms and legs, the, the regeneration possibility of that is, is it's just so rare. Um, stem cells, um, you know, injecting stem cells into the spinal cord. There's a lot of uh, rodent data on that. Um, there's a lot of data now that suggests pushing up the blood pressure, maintaining high blood pressure to help blood flow to the spinal cord while that area of bruise or injury and the area around that area of bruise or injury can get the blood flow, get the nutrients, get the normal things we have in our blood to that area to help, um, you know, let's say regenerate, but not really the nerves aren't physically growing back. It's a reduction of the inflammation. It's a little bit more increase of that signaling going across. And so um, we, we have seen some improvement. Uh, it is not something that is widely done uh, widely available uh, yet. I really, really, really want to commend the, the, the long-term care providers, the physical therapists, the, you know, the OT, PT uh, uh, speech. It is you guys that help these patients get better. You are continuing that stimulation, maintaining that 
uh, uh, neuromodulation, uh, that is really what makes the patients better. I've seen more so than, you know, injecting a stem cell into this, you know, spinal cord. There's ju it's just too early to, to know that. And, and I wish we were further along. There are individual cases here and there. Applying that broadly, though, I think is um, uh, yet, yet to come. Excellent. Thanks. We'll do one more question and then we'll uh, move on. Does anyone else have another question? We were joined by a couple other people. Uh, Brian Solomon came in uh, about 15 minutes ago. Brian, would you like to say good morning? Absolutely. Uh, good morning. Happy St. Patrick's Day, everybody. Um, sorry I was a, a little late, but did catch the end of the lecture and it was great. Um, thank you and uh, have a great day. Thanks, Brian. Uh, also, we have Barbara Roche, the true founder of Shan, join us. And I know that she would like to say a couple things and uh, close our meeting. Thanks, Barbara. Good morning. Hi, good morning, everyone. Happy St. Patrick's Day. And um, I did join a little bit late, but what I did hear was amazing. So thank you to our speakers today. Very much appreciated. Um, I hate missing a meeting, but I had a conflict. Um, and now that it is St. Patrick's Day, I always find on this day that I don't have a lot of green clothes. I don't know about anybody else, but today's the day I really realized that. And in October for Halloween, I realized I don't have any orange clothes, but anyway, um, so I did the best I could today. So the Irish proverb is, may your troubles be less and your blessings be more and nothing but happiness comes through your door. So have a great day, everyone. And thank you for choosing to be part of the Shan meeting. That, that is great. great. Thank you so much, Barbara and, uh, and uh, uh, John and, and uh, everyone. Uh, really appreciate the opportunity. I will put this out there. Uh, uh, if you guys want, you know, once a year, once every six months, I'm happy to come back and give, give another talk. Or if, if you guys would be uh, willing, I'm happy to uh, continue the conversation. And uh, Barbara, you hit on the color war challenge that I experienced in my household when my kids, four of them are put on different teams and we realize, wait a minute, we have no colors of any of the teams you were assigned. And so I commend you for your uh, efforts uh, this morning, but I, I thank everybody and wish everyone to have a, a great day, stay safe and stay healthy and uh, reach out if there's anything you guys need. And I thank you enough, Dr. I mean, fascinating. I think uh, incredible. What you do, amazing. Thank you. Thank you guys. I really appreciate it. Have a great day. Anybody else with announcements or anything? I've been talking with my mute on. I was just saying that. Thank you so much, doctor. I really appreciate you coming and speaking today. I'm just talking and talking. It's like I'm at my house talking to my wife and my kids. I just talk and talk and no one listens. Um, <laughs> <laughs> maybe I have a mute button at home also. Um, does anybody have any announcements that they'd like to say this morning? If no, uh, thank you to the Boca Chamber. Thank you guys, and Dr. Thank you again. Thank you everybody. Really, this was just incredible. And as always, thanks to Memorial, you know, for their amazing support. And really, just have a great day, everybody. I don't know if I should be optimistic or sad, but I feel <laughs> always optimistic. Happy St. Patrick's Day, everybody. Have a great day. Great. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks. Happy St. Patrick's Day.